Thank you. Hi, uh, welcome. Welcome very much to this uh, beautiful second day of the uh, IGF. We're uh, very, very happy uh, to be able to present uh, to you today uh, one of the two books that you found in your, um, in your goodie bag. I hope you were just quite as ecstatic as I was. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming. Um, over the next uh, 25 minutes, uh, we'll quickly talk about the, the background of the book, uh, why myths are such uh, important tools to understand uh, the internet and its challenges. And we also have the pleasure of, um, uh, of having a couple of uh, our great authors here present who will uh, briefly sketch out uh, their favorite uh, myth in one or two uh, minutes. So first of all, thank you very much to the uh, Federal Ministry uh, for Economy uh, for uh, supporting this uh, publication. Um, we uh, came to them and suggested that, and they were just as, as happy as we were uh, to contribute uh, to sharing uh, knowledge about, uh, about the Internet's uh, realities. Um, what we did was we uh, asked the international community uh, through social media, especially the international science community, to contribute their favorite myths to us. We collected about two to 300 different myths, then we vetted them, uh, had a little internal uh, vote on which myth were the most uh, prominent, the most challenging to overcome. And then we uh, asked 50 authors uh, to uh, solve the myth, to demystify uh, the, the claim they, they were making uh, on a, in a very brief format, a one page, uh, with only uh, one or two uh, sources which we wanted to have open access. So this is really a, um, an open access model for sharing and spreading information from the, uh, from the uh, start uh, to the end. Um, if you look at your, uh, at your books, um, I'm also happy to announce that uh, our websites are by now online uh, on internetmyths.eu and on internetmythen.de. You find all of the myths in a very attractive uh, format uh, conceptualized by our dear friends uh, from the agency Vagidas and Schmidt. Thank you very much. It looks beautiful. And um, you're able to, 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 to go into these myths in, just in, in, in even more depth. So just briefly, why did we choose to talk about myths? We saw myths uh, together with my co-editor, uh, Stefan Dreyer, uh, who can't be here uh, today and who sends his excuses. We saw myths as extremely seductive shortcuts. Uh, they're heuristics, they're, they shortcut cognitive engagement. They make us lazy, they make us easy to please consumers, they make us uninformed norm makers and norm appliers. We think that myths are bad for the internet, bad for its development, and bad for its use. In order to overcome these shortcuts, these heuristics, we need to think hard and think fast. That is why this is a uh, brief uh, and concise book that allows uh, a bit of background for this hard and critical thinking. In order to broaden our horizon, broaden our norms, uh, we need to broaden our understanding of the facticities of the online world. What is actually happening online? Only when we know that we can secure individual freedoms and ensure social cohesion. There's only one thing which we should never be flexible about. Those are the facts. Facts are holy and must remain so. So we need to dare to think um, we're here in Germany, so it's always nice to quote the big uh, Enlightenment thinkers. Let us dare to think. Let us go out of the iron cage of preconceived notions of internet policy making of, uh, for, of the years past. We have to realize that everything on the internet is related to each other, it's contingent upon each other, and every single distribution of rights and goods on the internet needs to be justified and including the status quo. So we cannot just say the status quo is the status quo and we shall not diverge. We have um, put together 50 myths in uh, five chapters. Um, there are uh, three of them uh, come from the main themes of the Internet Governance Forum of this year, security and safety, inclusion, integration, and um, data and disruption. We also inc included rights and rules and infrastructure and innovation. We're very happy that uh, Vince Cerf, one of the fathers of the internet um, 
was uh, able to contribute a little forward. He said that he didn't agree with all of the myths, but that's fine. I mean, he's uh, the, the technical uh, the genius behind this. So uh, we also have another forward by the director of the uh, Humboldt Institute where I'm working at, and a postscript by Professor Kleinwächter, who um, is one of the uh, leading internet governance uh, theorists um, from Germany. And now, without further ado, let's come to the thing that you're all expecting to hear, the myths. I won't go through all 50, of course, um, but let's start with the very first one. Of course, what people can do on the internet can be regulated. It's a myth that it cannot be. Online behavior is just subjected to a regulation just as any other behavior. Of course, some actors have an interest in telling us otherwise. If we do believe that you cannot enforce laws online, well, then you will stop demanding that from your government or demanding that from your company. If you really do feel disenfranchised, well, you know, you become lazy and complicit in your own human rights violations. So we have to ensure that everybody knows what people can do on the internet can be regulated. My personal uh, hobby horse is international law, and I showed in my myth that, yes, of course, international law applies to the Internet. There is no treaty yet. You know, there is no international covenant on the Internet. Uh, and probably we shouldn't have one. But customary international law, international uh, customary commitments apply to the Internet, and they secure the uh, legal and technical base on which the Internet runs. Code is law is something that you hear very, very often. Uh, a colleague from Finland, uh, the home of some of the greatest uh, intellectual minds of, our, uh, of the international uh, theory field, uh, argued that it's much more complex than that. Because, of course, code can be law in a way, but you have to look at code in the framework of normative pluralism. You have to think about how to regulate code in a sensitive way, in a way that is sensitive to human rights concerns. And you always have to uh, think about the different layers of legal, social, and technical regulation. Protocols have politics. It is a myth to assume that they do not. Uh, this overlooks completely how internet standardization occurs within a specific matrix of cultural, economic, and political contingencies. And now I'm very happy to turn over to our first uh, present author. Amelie, are internet platforms ever liable for user-generated content? Mm, um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, well, um, that they're not liable is definitely a myth um, that has been um, built up by some of the, the, the internet regulations, such as um, the Section 230 um, CDA in the, in the States and, um, and the e-commerce um, uh, regulation here uh, in, um, in Europe, but um, indeed, um, Intermediaries might not be publishers, but they are liable for the content that they um, that they uh, offer the infrastructure to publish, and um, it has somehow become yeah a myth that is. But I think that is slowly bursting and no longer really valid. Well, after this book, um, well after this book, we will have uh, certainly uh, burst. Uh, cyber war is also not coming. Don't fear, there will not be a digital Pearl Harbor. There are cyber attacks all the time, but we won't really be, uh, we don't have to expect a real cyber war, uh, according to Matthias Schulze. Um, the best cyber offense is also not necessarily a good cyber offense. So let's not talk all the time about preemptive capabilities, about persistent presence in foreign networks, about hackbacks, and especially not if they're not framed in a, a human rights sensitive way. But what about criminals? Is it only them that want anonymity online? Thorsten Thiel has mm -hmm. contributed on that. Yeah, I contributed on this, and um, this myth is even based on another myth that nobody knows you're a dog, famously, that the internet spreads anonymity, and, uh, there, and anonymity in itself is often conceptualized as something which kind of triggers bad behavior, and therefore has to be regulated or even outlawed, and the idea of these myth-busting article is uh, to show a little bit that anonymity has many other functions in society uh, which are worth uh, keeping and that especially the diminishing quality of vertical anonymity, so anonymity towards bigger political or economic associations uh, is very worth um, 
fighting for and uh, fighting against and uh, horizontal anonymity, anonymity between peers might be a little bit a different case, but still not only criminals want to have uh, many possibilities to communicate anonym anonymously. Thank you very much. So criminals have a hard time online, but what about people fighting for more rights, for more equality? Does the internet help them ensure uh, the end of all discrimination? Katharina Mosene has written about that. No, of course it did not. As you all know, we still see hate speech online, we see digital violence, especially against marginalized groups like women, people with disabilities, people with different skin colors. So, of course, the internet, unfortunately, did not end all discrimination and we still have to work on that topic. Thank you very much. Sad news, but um, an important call for, for action, especially in an international uh, arena such as this one. We talked about truth. Are fake news a real problem, or is it mainly uh, newspapers writing about fake news that make them so? Uh, Tommaso Venturini uh, 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 wrote that it is in fact the problem uh, we have is junk news, uh, which are not actually fake uh, news, but rather just bad and not, um, not uh, sustainable uh, content. They're much more difficult to debunk, which doesn't make it uh, much, much better. But fake news, he says, are not uh, the huge uh, problem facing online public uh, debate. Um, we have also Mark Graham with us. He's an uh, internet geographer from Oxford. Um, now, we talk a lot about uh, the, the new realities of work. Uh, has digital work become immaterial? Thanks, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, so the myth is, the myth is sort of that the digital work's Im immaterial, that it can be done from anywhere. You see this in uh, national development strategies of a lot of countries, the idea that you can bring jobs into a country because th this sort of work can be done from anywhere. Um, so this, this is all built on the idea that la labor is being commodified in quite an extreme way, that you can outsource work, not even pay attention to the ways that the worker is doing that work is a real person in a real place. So that's sort of the myth. That's, the, the, that's what's only partially true there because digital work, it doesn't go everywhere. It doesn't go anywhere. It settles in only particular places with the most advantageous political economies. So low wages, weak regulation, lack of... Uh, local alternatives. And so I guess what we need to do here is, is sort of better understand the specific ways in which work is actually embedded versus disembedded. It's not fully embedded, it's not fully disembedded. The way that it's actually material versus immaterial, the way that it's actually territorialized versus deterritorialized. And so the idea here is that we won't really be able to understand digital work and regulate digital work and build collective action strategies to pressure for better digital work without considering those, those actually existing relationships between materiality and immateriality. So the, just because a labor market can be everywhere doesn't mean it's nowhere. Thank you very much. So you see that even within some myth, there might be a grain of truth, but this book importantly offers, uh, offers uh, nuance. Um, where is the internet actually? Is it uh, down here or is it perhaps somewhere in the clouds? Uh, Daniel Felsen has uh, contributed uh, uh, a myth-busting article on this question. Yeah, hello everyone uh, and thanks first of all to you Matthias and Stefan for bringing this project together. It's great to be a part of this. Um, you invited me here today and promised there would be a party celebrating our work. I'm still <laughs> waiting for the drinks. You're, you're in I it. Hope, you're in it. <laughs> and, I hope, and I'm glad so many people came for the drinks. Uh, and I hope you don't expect an overly concise um, presentation since you all uh, got a copy of the books. I invite you to read as much as you can of them. Uh, I actually read more than my own chapter. Uh, <laughs> quite a lot of them. Actually, okay, so, but let's talk about internet and clouds. Um, so what, what got me started here was that there's so much talk of, of the cloud now when we're talking about the internet. Um, there's um, also a lot of talk about wireless communication. Um, in fact, many of us um, are getting used to communicating wirelessly um, most of the time. Um, and what I wanted to emphasize is that um, for all this talk about, about um, clouds and wireless, uh, there is a physical reality to the internet, and we should not forget about that. Um, the internet, in fact, relies on an extensive physical infrastructure of um, landline and submarine cables, internet 
exchange points, routers, servers, and so on. And why should we care about that? Why not just be happy with the cloud? Um, I think we need to also focus our debates on questions about access to this physical infrastructure, um, especially for many developing countries, that's a huge issue. And uh, I'm glad that this comes up a lot here during this, uh, this year's IGF and probably also earlier. IGFs. Um, so access is one big issue. Stability and security of the physical infrastructure is another major issue that we should, I think, pay more attention to. And finally, also, <clears throat> to the extent that we focus on the, on the physical side, on the physical infrastructure of the internet, I think that also leads us into inter interesting discussions about um, state control. Because for states, it's relatively easy to control the physical infrastructure if it's on their ter territory. And, that gives them great leverage, and that's another issue that we should think about. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. I remember one of my one of the first really lovely quotes I read about uh, clouds uh, was that uh, there is no such thing as a cloud is actually a server in a bunker in Utah, or by now perhaps in Germany. You know, think about the uh, the trend towards state um, uh, sovereignty. So perhaps the clouds are being um, regionalized. Um, who uh, rules uh, online discourse is one of the questions sort of um, pervasive to, 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 to online uh, norm making. Uh, we have myth uh, dispelling, uh, the, we have uh, myth contributions dispelling the myth that it is code that rules online world. We have um, myths dispelling that nobody rules uh, online discourses. And we have a myth uh, dispelling that um, it is algorithms which act in a uh, neutral way to ensure how um, content is produced and how knowledge is created. Uh, Matthias Spiegel, uh, come uh, from Algorithm Watch, uh, leading uh, thought think tank on uh, algorithm regulation, um, reminded us that, that algorithms uh, are always uh, contingent about what their base is. They uh, learn from data, they're trained on data, and they are optimized towards certain goals. If there are errors in the data, if there are um, uh, disadvantages, uh, if there are disenfranchisements, if there are instances of discrimination in the data, this will be something that the algorithm is trained on. As a researcher once compared it to, it would be like uh, training your child or teaching your child on the basis of a book from the 30s or 40s. Of course, that child would then regurgitate uh, uh, precondition, uh, pre, uh, wrong notions and discriminations. So it's important to ensure that the data that we use to train our algorithms is um, up to date and uh, can be controlled. Um, they are neither objective nor neutral. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, Christian Katzenbach from the uh, Humboldt Institute reminds us, is also not the, um, the, the, the thing that will fix everything. Mm -hmm. Sometimes humans using AI sensibly might fix some things, but uh, we shouldn't trust uh, AI technologies uh, to, uh, well, to make the world uh, a better place without us ensuring that they're actually responsive to societal challenges. What about one of my personal favorites, does the internet forget? Everybody would think so. Uh, just uh, just uh, today, the German Constitutional Court published two uh, orders, uh, two judgments, uh, called the right to be forgotten one and the right to be forgotten two. Uh, th that may be true, but as uh, my co-editor uh, Stefan uh, Dreyer re reminds us, one huge problem is that the internet does often forget. Many files have a very short half-life. There is uh, so-called URL decay, which I find is a lovely notion. Um, there was a study on court judgments in the U.S. that found that within three years, 60% of links contained in court judgments, which are in the public record, no longer work. That is a huge problem. It, was like, it would be like uh, the, the articles that those court judgments refer to no longer exist. So we need to seriously think about how to make the Internet forget less, or rather, forget the better things, you know? Uh, it's, it's good that, they, that, they, uh, that there's a more nuanced approach to ensuring uh, the weighing of freedom of information and the rights to personality. But let's also talk about the importance of um, keeping our, um, uh, well, keeping our, our public uh, archives. Now, um, I'm very happy um, to have presented this here, and I'm also very happy to, to, uh, uh, to say that one of the, the key 
points we found was that the intricate connection between humans, data, algorithms, and, uh, and rules uh, can only be understood by a multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder approach. We need to together think about what kind of vision we want for the Internet to have. And we should not rely on myth. We should think, for instance, on how to use data to increase uh, democratic potential. There's actually um, a great uh, panel which will happen at 3 o'clock on that exact question, how to ensure that data fights democracies uh, lead to, to better uh, social uh, cohesion uh, in, in room two. Um, just a short plug. Now, uh, for the last uh, eight minutes that we have, um, I would love to open the floor. We have so many stellar experts here. Uh, are there any myths that you think we missed? Because next year we want to do another section on the 100 myth of the internet. So if there are any myths uh, that you want to talk about, you have a couple of minutes now to ask me or my fellow, uh, my fellow speakers. And if you're really happy with that, uh, you can also send them in later, and uh, then you can perhaps uh, grab some lunch, and uh, we can have a little private party outside. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you to the authors. Thanks to the Federal Ministry for financing this endeavor. And uh, let us uh, make sure that the truth uh, reigns free offline and online. Thank you very much.